I was the superintendent in chief of the Boston Police Department. I had the privilege and honor, just like you have the privilege and honor of serving your citizens, of serving the citizens of Boston for 28 years as a police officer. And on April 15, 2013, I had the duty to be the incident commander during the Boston Marathon bombing. When I began my career in policing, I knew exactly what it was about, and you do too. It's about good versus evil, right? That's what we signed up for. That's what we do. When the marathon bombing happened, I saw evil attack good. And 102 hours later, we, the men and women of the Boston Police Department, our EMS, our medics, our firefighters, our nurses, our doctors, our citizens, we overcame evil together. That was a very powerful thing. But right now, in America, there's a conversation, we're calling it, right? That's what we're saying. It's a conversation about policing. And I can tell you, during the course of my career, good versus evil turned into us versus them. And that's a mistake that is so wrong for all of us. Because when it's us versus them, we all lose. We all lost in Cleveland when it was us versus them. We all lost in New York when it was us versus them. We all lost in South Carolina when it was us versus them. There isn't one of you in this room who saw that video and didn't cringe. I've been at community meetings where they've accused my officers of shooting innocent people in the back because they were members of the minority community. And I would scoff at that idea. That's unconscionable, that would never happen. Police officers would never do that. And we watched, all of us watched that video. And every one of our jobs got harder the day that video hit YouTube. Us versus them, we lost in South Carolina. Us versus them, we lost in Baltimore. Us versus them, we lost in New York twice in 2015. Us versus them, we lost in Mississippi. Us versus them, we lost in the streets of Boston. What's our job? What's the mission? What am I supposed to do, right? I learned it in the police academy. I learned every element of the Massachusetts general laws. 266.22, as you all well know, breaking and entering into the chicken coop is a felony. You break into a chicken coop in Massachusetts, it's a five-year felony. The owner of that chicken coop can hold you in custody for up to 48 hours in a convenient place of his choosing. Still on the books today. <laughs> if you punch a teach her in the nose and break her nose, it's a misdemeanor for which the police officers can make no arrest. So I, the mission was clear. I went to the academy. You could arrest for this, felony misdemeanor, felony misdemeanor, arrest no arrest, arrest no arrest, arrest no arrest. They taught me how to do things. They taught me how to arrest people. And I would go to roll call, and they would give me a car, and we would take our car and drive as fast as we could to where they sold dope to try and arrest the people selling dope. And then we would get them back to the station and try and process them through so we could go back out and get more people selling dope. That's what they wanted us to do. The community was asking us to do this. They would ask every week, how many people did you arrest selling dope? Well, we arrested more people last week than this week. That's good. Arrest more dope deep. Arrest more people with guns. We're supposed to arrest people, right? That's our mission. We're in charge of terrorists, robbers, drug dealers, drug users, the domestic batterers, organized crime guys, hackers, brawlers, drunkards. Oh, by the way, the mentally unstable, that's your problem too, right? You didn't create mental institutions that don't address the mental health problems that are facing America right now, but you're the answer to that problem. You didn't create crumbling schools that don't educate our children, but you're the answer to that problem. You're the people they call. You didn't create homelessness, but you're the answer. No one else answers those 911 calls. You're the front line. How many things are we to people in the United States? How many solutions are we to our citizens that we serve? We're all things to all people. Think of what your cops do on a daily basis, right? Radio calls, accident reports, notifying family members of someone dying, mental health calls, perhaps engaging in a shootout. I gotta tell you, this really, really summed up my career in the BPD when I really learned how much we meant to so many people. How much we meant. I was at a community meeting at 8 a.m. at Ringer Park. They were determining whether to make a dog park where you could let your dog go off leash. And it had caused some debate. 
300 of my good citizens were at 8 a.m. ready for a debate. 150 on one side who wanted the dog park, 150 who didn't want the dog park. And one of the major concerns that I had to deal with as the chief of the Boston Police Department was dog shit. <laughs> who was going to pick up the dog shit? And what are we going to do when they don't pick up the dog droppings? That was my concern, and 300 people debated that issue for hours, intently. And four hours later, I responded to our streets, where two people were slain in a violent incident by young kids with guns. The community meeting we had two days later after that, we were lucky to get six people to talk to us about that problem. And a couple hours after that, I had to go deal with a terrorist attack that was being planned in my city to be taken on Washington, D.C. against the Capitol, and get briefed on that. So in one day, I was able to tell my mother that I was in charge of everything in the city of Boston, from dog droppings to terrorism. Because we're the solutions for all of society's problems. We're the front lines. What happens when it's us versus them? There's mistrust. How does that mistrust play out? I get a call when I'm on uh, a couple of days off with a friend of mine. I respond to a park, a city park. There was a four-year-old child shot in a park. Shot in a park playing. 200 people saw this happen. My officers raced to that call. They ran towards those bullets. They endangered their lives. They got that child. They did first aid on that child. And they saved that little boy's life. And those same police officers looked at the 200 people who were in that park with their own children. And they said to them, who shot the little boy? And they were told, we didn't see a thing. I'm not telling you shit. How in God's name could a human being allow a four-year-old little baby in my city to get shot and not help the police? How could that possibly occur? How did that happen? Fear. Legitimate fear. If you get involved, we've all heard snitches get stitches. If you get involved, you will become a victim yourself. And I look at and poo-poo that, because on Milton Avenue and High Park, you don't do anything wrong. Me and my neighbors will come out and testify against any one of you. But where the bullets are flying, it's not Milton Avenue and High Park. I live in a different neighborhood, even though I live three miles from where this park was. It's a different community. They have different challenges. Fear is a different thing for them than it is to us. We cannot underestimate the reality of that fear. Mistrust. How do they get to mistrust us? Why do they say, why should I help them? Why is it us versus them? And is it black versus white? Is it, is it poor versus rich? Is it, is it powerless versus powerful? What's our past history? How many South Carolinas have people endured that caused them to mistrust the police? And why don't they see the good work that those officers who ran towards that little baby do every day? Why? played out for me one day as a little girl in a mailbox. I saw the gang kids from the Humboldt gang. They were gathered on the street corner. And those kids shot the kids in the Castlegate gang. That's just what they did. They went back and forth shooting each other. And I saw a group of them were hanging on a corner. And I knew they had just shot their rivals a couple days before. And I was quite suspicious that the rivals would find them and shoot back. And the thing that got me really upset was a 12-year-old little girl sitting on the mailbox next to these gang thugs, kicking her feet, enjoying a beautiful day. And I got out of my police car because I thought that's what my community wanted me to do. And I threw the kids off the corner. And I said to that young girl, please, young lady, what are you doing? This is a bad place to be. These are bad kids. You shouldn't be up here. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I'm just waiting for my friend. Well, go back to your house. This is not a good place for you to be, young lady, okay? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. And she skipped off down the street. I looped the block two more times. The gang kids were gone. It was all set. I'm going to go get my Code 10. I went and Code 10's a, a pizza for me. And I got my pizza and I ordered it and I got it in the car, and I did this weird, wacky thing where I used to bring my pizza and sit in my, my assigned sector and eat it there as opposed to being in the station because I, I never found criminals turning themselves into the guard room. I found I've, if I stayed in my sector, I would find the criminals. And before I got the first slice out of that pizza, a call came in for shots fired right by the mailbox at Ruthven and Humboldt. And when I got there, the gang kids had returned, and their rivals found them. And unfortunately, 12-year-old little Tiffany Moore returned too. And as often happens in our communities, the bullets didn't hit the rivals. It struck Tiffany Moore. And I watched Tiffany Moore die next to that mailbox that I threw her off a half hour before. Man, they did that on my watch in my city. 
my bosses were pissed. We were all pissed. The direction at roll call the next day was go get them. Go get them. Yeah, we were going to go get them. I'm not even sure who they were, but we got them. I'll tell you, we, they were got. A bunch of people were got. We arrested a bunch of people. We did motor vehicle stops, FIOs. We searched kids. We stopped kids. We arrested, searched, stopped, arrested. We flooded the area, 250 cops. The gang kids put their heads down and went underground. We arrested Ed the electrician, though, because he had a suspended license. And he didn't have a chance to get down and pay his fine because he's putting his kids through college. We arrested Maggie, uh, who, who failed to show for jury service. That was a good warrant arrest. Because the community wanted stats. They wanted something done. It didn't stop there. We had a, a couple coming from Lamar's class where an African-American male was reported to have gotten in the car and shot them. The wife and the child died. The husband was gravely injured. The community wanted a death penalty. They wanted results. Do something about these people. Go get them. Go get them. The press, they led about the African-American male. How could this happen to a white affluent couple in the city of Boston? How could this possibly happen? Well, our detectives, they weren't actually going there. They found it funny that he had a girlfriend that would show up two days after his wife and child died. They found it funny that he recently took out a $250,000 insurance policy on his wife. But the press, they created the us versus them dialogue. And I can tell you, that event still tears at the community mistrust and the fabric of the city of Boston to this day. There are people who still remember it. A community falsely accused. By the way, us versus them is a community conversation that we're having with our community members, and we can't police without the community engaging us, right? There's definitely an us versus them. Uh, how do you want us to police? Militaristic, non-militaristic, tasers, non-tasers, sticks, no sticks, de-escalation, militarization, whatever you want to call, intelligence-led policing, community policing, whatever we're doing, we talk with the community about it. That's us versus them. But there's another us versus them that happens in our agencies, especially when you lead an agency. And sometimes you forget that because I was actually a real cop. And then I became a boss. Has anyone in this room ever heard the words, they're going to screw you in a police guardroom in America? Have you ever heard that in a squad car in America, that they're going to screw you? I heard that my entire career. They're going to screw you, kid. They're going to screw you. They're going to screw you. And I kept looking. They're not going to get me. I will find them. They're not gonna, no one's going to screw me. No, no, no. And I went up the ranks. And I remember looking in the mirror one day, having to make a tough decision. And I said, holy shit, you're they. You're the guy doing the screwing. We have conversations with our cops all the time about what we tell them to do, what we want them to do. What we need to do is engage those cops in a conversation about why we're doing it. Why are we not wearing our riot gear? Well, here's a reason for it. And once you understand and you get their feedback, the best practitioners of our craft are in the cruises of America today. And we need to engage, as we engage our community in the conversation about how we police, we need to engage our cops in how that, com that community uh, reaction uh, works, how we're going to do that together. Two conversations are occurring in America right now. Do nothing and do it well. You're going to get killed. You're going to get injured. You're going to get sued. You're going to get wrongly disciplined. Your family's going to wind up threatened. You're going to wind up the, the top uh, grossing video on YouTube. You're going to go viral. Why would you do it? Do nothing, kid, and do it well. Just collect your pension. I can tell you right now, none of you have that mindset. You're not in this room today because this is a job you do. You're in this room today because this is a vocation you live. Thank you. Spread the gospel. What's the community think of us? It was mentioned earlier, we're racist, we're liars, we're thieves, we create crime. We don't care about the community. Cuffs beat people for no reasons, we're incompetent, we get away with abuse, we get away with murder. We don't care about the community. <laughs> Tiffany Moore's image comes to me so many times that vivid experience that Kevin had on the bridge comes to him so many times. It's trauma that we live with, that we would do anything to prevent it because we care about our community. But yet, the community doesn't understand it. Do we racially profile? No police officer I know has left his squad room and said he's going to go racially profile people. However, 
the way we're deploying officers, the way we're responding to calls, the way the stats are, that's in fact the reality. We have to figure out why, and it can't be conversations on opposite sides. Let's get the community, the police, and the cops who need to do the work in the same room. Let's get the frontline police officers in this room for this conversation. As bosses and supervisors, we go to conferences and we learn great topics and great ideas. And sometimes our frontline officers can't take a break and catch their breath to exchange the information. These are issues impacting their safety and their livelihood. And we have to engage each other in a conversation today. Sir Robert Peel said it best, you cannot police without the public. Peace, the police are the public and the public are the police. Order is only maintained when the public supports the police. When I ask cops, what do you want? They're quite clear in their message to me. Chief, tell me what the mission is. Tell me what the rules are. If I do the mission that you told me it was, and I abide by the rules that everyone agreed upon, then protect me. Protect me. If I use the taser that we thought would help us limit liability, limit use of force options, limit injuries to people, why am I being criticized and trending on YouTube because I used a taser? All we want to do is know what the mission is and what the rules are. And don't change the rules because the press doesn't like the story. Where do we go from here? There's more forums like this. There's conversations in guard rooms. There is training. There is cultural change that has to occur. We are in a crisis in policing. What an amazing opportunity to make amazing change. We should not be occupying neighborhoods. We should be policing neighborhoods. We need to utilize our intelligence, our technology. We need to be transparent. We can take life and we can take liberty. We need to let people know that we have nothing to hide. We'll open the books, we'll show you what we do, we'll show you why we do it. We need to educate our community on the decisions we make and why we make them. We've got a lot of work to do. And the first thing we've got to do is engaging that frontline troop in that process, as well as the best way to implement it. My thoughts and idea, the mission of all of us in this room, the mission of our members of our community, is to do good, meaningful work together. When you do that, evil will always be defeated by good, as it was in April of 2013. God bless the men and women of law enforcement, and God bless the United States of America.